Hello YouTube, welcome to the Warzone, I'm Scruffy, and this is Scruffy Tales. And uh, it took a week or so, but it finally happened. Russia has moved in reinforcements to Kursk to contain the Ukrainian incursion. So the uh, Center for uh, Defense Strategies has uh, uh, released uh, some information on the uh, Russian forces that have been sighted uh, in Kursk uh, taking part in fighting and it numbers to around 10 to 11 battalions uh, mainly various motorized brigades and battalions uh, so how large is a Russian battalion well we uh, the battalion tactical group that Russia relied upon uh, before the war, uh, roughly was between 700 to 800 troops. Uh, if that is true for a motor rifle brigade, I don't know, uh, but we'll use that uh, as reference at least. And so uh, I've even seen numbers as low as 400 troops per battalion. Uh, so that may also be true, but we will use the higher number of 800 just for the sake of argument. So that means that currently we have as many as 8,000 to 9,000 Russian troops redeployed to Kursk uh, to counter the uh, Ukrainian incursion. On the flip side, that could also be as low as 4,000 to 5,000 troops. Uh, a bit unclear. Uh, also, the this uh, is if these formations are at full strength, and uh, also if they have all arrived uh, with every uh, soldier available in the formation. I mean, for all we know, it could be a couple of companies that have arrived that belong to these uh, units, and the major formation has not yet uh, deployed in full we don't know but uh, the total strength is estimated as it says to 10 to 11 battalions and that could be as low as 4,000 troops or as high as 8,000 or 9,000 and what are they up against well uh, I've seen numbers that suggests that Ukraine has deployed some 10,000 troops to Kursk uh, and I've even seen numbers ranging around 15,000, but I'm going to be using 10,000 because that seems to be the estimate, just like with the Russian forces here, uh, looking at the Ukrainian uh, units involved and what they would be at full strength at the beginning of this operation, then that seems to line up with 10,000 troops. So if we take a look here, here we have the Ukraine control map. Over here we have Andrew Perpetua's map. And uh, as you can see, they align more or less uh, with each other. Uh, we have this uh, Ukrainian push in the south here. As you can see here, there's bold move to probably try and cut off uh, the Russians here from reinforcements, potentially move around uh, in an encirclement. Uh, a maneuver you have uh, Ukrainians pushing up this way as well so we may, we may look at a pincer move potentially um, we, we, we'll have to wait and see uh, but as you can see we have a lot of Russian forces that have now pushed in joining in on the fight along this eastern uh, eastern flank meanwhile uh, we have some Russian troops uh, not as many as on the eastern flank coming in here on the northern end, trying to contain the Ukrainian push northward along the two main highways here, trying to reach uh, the main European highway up here that could either, either take them uh, further west to the Ukrainian border or east to uh, the Kursk nuclear power plant or Kursk, uh, the city of Kursk itself. Uh, and here we have uh, zoomed out a bit with the Ukraine control map. And as you can see, uh, 
as Russia is now beginning to push in with more troops, Ukraine probably has reached the extent of uh, their push into Russia because now they will be more forced to allocate manpower, uh, resources, and what have you to counter the presence of uh, potentially 8,000 Russian troops. Uh, so uh, I think th there's still a chance that Ukraine can do some maneuvers. Uh, seeing as they are mainly a mechanized force with some assault brigades and support and the Russians are at the moment only mainly motorized uh, units, trucks and light APCs uh, mainly and some tanks probably in support but nothing, no major armored units are currently uh, up here uh, on behalf of Russia and uh, they are still down here uh, at Kharkiv so the question is will Russia begin to allocate armored units from this front all the way up here. I think that makes sense. Uh, these are light units, fast units that can travel fast, long roads and highways. So that is more than likely why they have shown up first. Uh, they have rushed into position to contain the Ukrainians. And I'm guessing we have Russian armored units moving down here somewhere, uh, moving up to join in on the fight. Because if you take a look at this map, I mean, this is what Russia is fighting for along the Kharkiv front. And I mean, compared to this, this must be more of a priority for Russia, right? They surely must be allocating resources from Kharkiv to uh, prevent this from expanding further uh, into Russia. I mean, it's not that far to Kursk and it's not that far to uh, the main highway here, here uh, European Highway E38. Uh, I mean, if Ukraine pushes up here and begins pushing west, they can grab a lot of territory from Russia. And it is important for Russia to uh, be quick about it as well, as we can see here from this uh, tweet. What's, what's it called these days? Seat? Shit? <laughs> what the hell do they call these when it's X? I don't know. This Twix, I can't, Twix uh, thing uh, has found a Russian uh, uh, military reporter who has said uh, some interesting things about the Ukrainian incursion. And if we take a look at what he's saying here, time is against us. Once the enemy picks up shovels in two days, it will be just as difficult to take the forest stands as it was near Avdivka. Uh, but again, I repeat that the window of opportunity is rapidly closing. And why is he talking about this? Uh, well, because uh, there has been reports of Ukraine actually building defenses in the Kursk Oblast and even potentially even building trenches uh, within uh, Ukrainian occupied territory in Russia. So. This military reporter, Alexander Karchenko, he is worried that uh, Ukraine is fortifying their positions within Kursk Oblast. And he is, as he says, really worried that it will turn uh, the town of uh, Sudja into a new Avdivka. So what does that mean? if Ukraine can turn Sucha into a new Avdivka. Well, uh, we had a r prominent pro-war Russian blogger um, who was an ultra-nationalist commentator who also fought alongside Russian-backed separatists in Eastern Ukraine in 2014. Uh, he famously uh, was quite annoyed at uh, Russian losses at uh, Avdivka. Uh, as he reported that Russia had lost 16,000 troops uh, during the capture of this city. And uh, this somehow resulted in him taking suicide not that long after. Very strange how, how, how that took place. Uh, and he wrote on his Telegram account that Russia had lost 16,000 troops and 300 pieces of armor uh, at Avdivka. And he was heavily criticizing the uh, Russian uh, generals for uh, uh, 
the performance at Avdivka. At the same time, uh, we have reports from Ukraine itself that Russia lost up to 47,000 Russians uh, killed or injured. So presumably 16,000 dead and the rest of these guys wounded. Uh, to be compared with uh, 25,000 lost so Soviet soldiers in uh, during the Soviet Afghan war. Uh, and also if we take a look at the ISW report, uh, we have uh, that during four months of fighting at Avdivka, Russia lost 47,000 personnel, 364 tanks, uh, a bunch of artillery, and 748 armored fighting vehicles. So that is what uh, Russian uh, commentators are worried uh, will happen at Sucha if Ukraine is allowed to properly dig in and fortify their positions. And if we take a look at Sucha down here, here's the city and we have a bunch of suburbs and what have you. What is it Russia will be attacking? Well, they will be attacking wide open farmland, which is deadly terrain for vehicles. Now when we have thousands of drones flying around in the air and take a look at these wide open farmland areas uh, that Ukraine will uh, be covering with drones. Russian approaches will be difficult. They will be forced to come down this way. I mean, this becomes a choke point uh, easily targeted with artillery and missile strikes. Uh, you have railroad and suburbs, a natural defensive line combined with good defensive positions. Here's the railroad uh, uh, along every single front line. When we have come across a railroad, it has become a natural defensive line, uh, either for Ukraine or Russia. Whenever uh, the attacking side reaches a railroad, it becomes difficult to cross it because it's a natural defensive line and it cuts through these smaller towns and suburbs uh, which is basically prepared defendable uh, prepared uh, defenses uh, prepared defensive positions i should say and uh, which makes it even dif more difficult for an attacker uh, and since you basically need uh, between five and ten soldiers of your own for every enemy soldier defending such a location. And then you have the valley and the river. And this here, you can see here, you have a river running through this valley here that separates uh, the towns, the suburbs from the city of Sucha. And I mean, Russia has yet to enter Chasiv Yar and Russia has yet to conquer Volchansk, two Ukrainian cities that are uh, defended by a river. And here we have another similar situation where Russia will have to cross wide open fields, fight their way through uh, very defendable positions, and then reach a river that will cause massive issues for Russia, just uh, like we have seen at Chasiv Yar and Volchansk. And then Sucha itself and all these surrounding towns. And as it says, in urban warfare, standard doctrine dictates that you need a 10 to 1 advantage in manpower to successfully assault enemy positions. So Russia needs to cross all of this open area, fight their way through these uh, suburbs, somehow get across the river and then enter Sudja and the surrounding towns. And at this stage, they need a 10 to 1 advantage to hope to take back Sudja. I mean, yeah, you get the point. And, and on top of that, we have the reports of Ukraine uh, digging trenches and preparing uh, def uh, their positions. And going up against the trench line, conventional wisdom states that you need an advantage of five to one in manpower to succeed with an assault. So if Ukraine begins to fortify all of these locations, it immediately, immediately becomes increasingly difficult for Russia to push in. So as you can imagine, there, there is a real fear among Russian commentators that Sucha will become another Avdivka, another Bakhmut. 
The 8,000 troops Russia has rushed into the area are mainly infantry formations relying on basic transports. Nothing strange about it since Russia needs a lot of troops in the area quickly and trucks and wheeled APCs are able to move very quickly along roads and highways. But you don't take ground with infantry, you take ground with armor. You hold ground with infantry. Russia is sending in the troops needed to quickly contain the Ukrainians and prevent them from pushing deeper into Kursk Oblast. And this will probably be successful, unless Ukraine can exploit the pincer move that appears to be happening in the southeast. But motorized infantry is not what Russia can rely upon to effectively challenge Ukrainian positions, especially since Ukraine has invaded with mechanized formations supported by assault brigades. To truly challenge the Ukrainians, especially if they have dug in, Russia needs armored units. Will Russia pull those armored formations from Kharkiv? Or somewhere else, Kupiansk perhaps? Because Russia needs them. Russia has around 8,000 troops going up against potentially 10,000 Ukrainians. But Russia has deployed fast-moving, motorized infantry carried by trucks and APCs. Ukraine has heavily armored mechanized battalions supported by assault brigades. Ukraine has more firepower supporting each soldier than what Russia can muster currently. Ukraine still has the advantage, even if the Russian forces can slow Ukraine down. And Russia has no choice. Russia has to attack. That means going up against Ukrainians in trenches, against Ukrainians in fortified buildings. That means Russia needs firepower as well as a 5 or 10 to 1 advantage in manpower. 8,000 infantry and trucks will not be enough to take Sudja. And also, remember, Sudja is a Russian town. Will Russia bomb its own town and reduce it to dust and ashes? like Russia does to Ukrainian settlements. If Ukraine has 10,000 troops in the Kursk Oblast, Putin will need to gather a significant force to throw Ukraine out of Russia. The question is if 50,000 will be enough when Ukraine defends open farmland with drones, has artillery and missiles aimed at logistic routes, and can control choke points over the river like they do at Chasiv Yar. And we know how devastating it has been for Russia to assault Bakhmut and Avdivka head on. So, uh, yeah, uh, Russia has moved in, as you can see. They have troops now basically along the entire incursion. Uh, Ukraine will probably not be able to push all that much further unless they can exploit the fact that they have more heavily armored units uh, than Russia is currently fielding and uh, potentially even have a slight manpower advantage in the area so they can still potentially make use of this move here and move up and force these uh, units to fall back that could happen uh, but overall i think russia will be able to contain uh, the incursion and ukraine will begin to prepare to hold what they have gained and like I said, uh, we have reports that Ukraine is beginning to dig in uh, in places here within Kursk itself. So it's not unthinkable that Ukraine will eventually fall back to these uh, positions where they have built defenses and perhaps give up some of these northern positions in order to uh, concentrate their forces, uh, make logistical uh, supplies more uh simplified as they're trying to hold what they've gained and fortified uh, but the question is where will russia get the troops in order to force ukraine to fall back to these defendable positions how will russia prevent ukraine from pushing further out into the kursk oblast because like i said ukraine has more heavily armored units and Russia has motorized infantry. They can't, they can't hold ground, but they can't really hold indefinitely against armored pushes that Ukraine is currently uh, undertaking in this area. That means 
Russia needs forces from somewhere else, and they have all their, you know, heavily armed armored forces are engaged along the entire front. So they need to pull forces from Kharkiv, from Kupiansk, uh, maybe from Chesivyar, uh, Pokrovsk, who knows? Uh, but they need to come from somewhere. And I mean, take a look at the size of uh, the territory that Ukraine has pushed in and taken over compared to the Kharkiv front, compared to the push from Avdivka towards Pokrovsk. I mean, this is on a whole other magnitude than what Russia has achieved at the uh, Kharkiv, for instance, and even down here at Avdivka. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. But Russia, I mean, Russia really does need to address this. Uh, 8,000 infantry and trucks is not enough to uh, make a dent on this. Uh, maybe prevent Ukraine from pushing all that much deeper in. But, I mean, they won't be able to push in and uh, force Ukraine out of Russia with those forces. They need to send in more heavily armored units, um, potentially from Kharkiv. So we'll see what happens. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think the next couple of days will, uh, yeah, will be very interesting. And that's it. Uh, yeah, uh, Russia by the looks of it, have enough troops to challenge Ukraine, uh, but not enough troops to force Ukraine to leave. For that, they need to take troops from somewhere else, and that will affect that section of the front line uh, to the extent that probably, if we're talking about the Kharkiv front, uh, if Russia moves forces from Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine will probably be able to force Russia out of uh, Ukraine along that front line. Uh, so yeah, the next coming days will be super important and very, very interesting to see what happens uh, now that Russia is beginning to uh, mount a proper defense in the Kursk Oblast. Uh, as always, go pomarsh Ukraine, give them hell.